So today we're going to talk about test-driven development. Uh, first, I'd like to start with a show of hands. Like, who here knows what TDD stands for? All right. Keep your hands up. Have you ever practiced or tried TDD? Drop your hand if you have not. OK, so most of us have some passing experience. That's great. Uh, who practices it regularly? Keep your hands up. Who practices it regularly in their JavaScript code? OK, more hands go down. Who here knows what a test double is? Yeah. OK, so a test double, real quick, because I'm not going to explain what a test double is as part of this talk. A test double is uh, like a stunt double, literally, but for your test. So anytime a fake thing stands in for a real thing when you're writing a test, we call that a test double. So if you've ever heard of a mock object before, a mock object is an example of a test double. Uh, it's just a specific type. A uh, little bit about myself. Uh, let's see, so uh, uh, that's my hand-drawn logo. Uh, my name is Searles on Twitter. Uh, like Brian mentioned, I come from an agency called Test Double. We were founded in Columbus. Uh, our nearest person is Amber Conville. She lives in Detroit. She's actually the organizer of Self Conference. I uh, hope you'll be able to join us for that uh, in May. Uh, if you got any feedback, I'd love if you emailed us hello at testdouble.com. Uh, so fundamentally, a question I get asked a lot, and frankly, a question I ask myself a lot, is why bother with test-driven development? Uh, if you've uh, uh, ever practiced or heard of test-driven development, you've probably heard of like red, write a failing test before you write your real code, green, make that test pass, May, you know, write the working code to make the test work, and then purple, refactor the code into something that isn't so ugly. And that's the basic rhythm. It's a very, very simple workflow that you can teach anybody in 30 minutes. Uh, but for actually living with it and making it be like your primary workflow for getting all of your tasks done as a developer, uh, it's much more nuanced than that. And in fact, I've really flown off the rails in the test-driven development community in terms of how I practice it. Uh, so much so that somebody posted a blog post today of the three different types of test-driven development. It was literally like classical TDD, Marcus TDD, and then whatever the hell Justin Searles does. Uh, so <laughs> you're getting like the new age chiropractics of test-driven development here today versus the uh, traditional style. But what I look for in test-driven development are four values, four benefits. First is focus. It helps me focus on exactly what I'm trying to accomplish at any given point. Uh, the second thing is a sense of progress, small iterative steps over the course of my day to give me the little tiny boost of endorphins while I'm working. The third thing I help is I'm a high anxiety individual and it helps address blank page syndrome where like somebody hands me a new feature card, I've never done that before and I immediately freak out and ask myself how the hell am I going to do that. It gives me a little bit of an answer to get started. And then finally, it slows me down. It prevents me from just hacking together a bunch of code that totally does work but that I'm never going to find the rainy day for in which to clean that up and tie it back into nicely named small modules later. It forces me to think up front. So those are the benefits that I'm looking at today. And keep those in the back of your mind, because when I say that, a lot of people are saying, you know, wait a second, I thought test-driven development was about tests. This is about testing. Test-driven development gets sold into a lot of organizations as being like an, a path through which you will have no defect code anymore. There won't be any bugs because there will be a test for absolutely everything. 100% test coverage, test, test, test. And frankly, like I feel like orthogonally to my experience in test-driven development, I've also become a bit of a testing expert. I feel like test-driven development is not a sufficient uh, test automation strategy at all, uh, if it even is one. So, so clear from your mind the idea that the tests that shake out of a test-driven development process have any sort of like long-lasting regression value. They might, but it's totally, in my opinion, secondary. Um, so hearing all of this, uh, you might think like I take TDD for sort of like it's off-label use. Like all of these happy side effects of TDD are why I'm really here. I'm not really here just for all of the tests. Um, and frankly, a lot of the things that I said that TDD helps me with are soft skill kind of things. They help address the fact that uh, teams move way too quickly to try to just shove features out the door. They help me with the fact that I'm really anxious whenever I take on a new big feature to figure out how I'm going to break it down. Uh, they really help me focus on one thing at a time instead of getting stuck into deep rabbit holes that are irrelevant to what I'm trying to do. This is what uh, the lens through which I hope that you look at the code that we're about to share. Uh, uh, because I don't think it's necessarily about writing a test that makes sure something works. Whether it works or not is usually going to be pretty obvious. 
So today we're going to try this thing that I cooked up. I call it the unusual spending kata. Uh, in TDD parlance, a kata is an ex exercise that we can repeat and, 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 and use as a lesson to kind of glean some sort of insight. And I call it the unusual spending kata because it's inspired by a feature of Mint, uh, if you've ever used the Mint tool. Um, and you can actually find my code uh, and a readme describing how to do the problem at github.com slash test double slash unusual dash spending. Uh, in fact, uh, if I totally bomb up here in my explanation, feel free to clone that and peruse the solution branch and it'll walk through step by step each of the commits that I'm going to take or to review that later. So suppose the, the conceit of this talk, uh, of, this, of this kata, is like you work at a bank, uh, you issue credit cards, and the credit card company bank wants to get people off of Mint and as a value add to their card holders, uh, send them a notification when they spend too much on any category of merchants. So in this example, like our story card as we're handed it by our, by our product owner is we want to notify cardholders when they spend more than the usual amount on any category like golf or travel or restaurants. Uh, and the way that we're going to do that is basically break it down into three parts. You know, so given that we have a user ID, we're told that we need to look up this and last month's payments. There'll just be a big stream of payments. Next, we need to group those payments by category, compare them from this month to last month for total spending amounts. OK, do a little bit of math. And then finally, we've got to email the cardholder a summary of that spending. Now, a couple of caveats that tend to happen in real life business talk whenever we're building software is like, we don't write the payment API. Some other team writes the payment API, and they're way behind, and it doesn't actually exist yet. Somebody else internally maintains a module for all email stuff, so we're not going to write our own email module. That's a third party thing, and it doesn't exist yet. But we still are responsible for shipping this in some reasonable amount of time. Uh, so, so we got to find a way to be productive in spite of that. Now, uh, if you've practiced classical TDD, you're going to want to try to figure out, like you're always asking yourself, how do I write a test for that? How do I write a test to make sure that this notification goes out? Well, first, let's say I'm going to create a new NPM module. Uh, Anyone here know Node.js? I, I know this is a JavaScript meetup. All the examples today are Node.js, but keep in mind that other than like the common uh, JS module import stuff, all of this stuff would work in browsers as well, uh, including the testable JS library that we're going to show. So like you might try writing a test like, hey, so I'm going to require this unusual spending library. That's going to be the entry point of my uh, entry point function of my feature and some user ID 42. Well, I'm going to invoke my function, pass it that user ID. So that's like my setup. OK, I got that. This is my action I'm going to take. And then, whoa, what, what's my, what am I asserting on? Like I could go into that user's email and make sure the notification's there, but that just prompts more questions. How am I going to like go and get those payments into a payment server? Is it a fake payment server? Uh, how am I going to trigger this notification if the email thing isn't actually there? And it's just way too, it's not like when I talked about getting a sense of progress out of TDD, like this is way too big a step to hope to provide any additional uh, a sense of forward momentum than just cowboy coding it all in the first place would have been. So this just isn't really a, uh, uh, enough to be productive. Uh, uh, so a lot of people get to this point, they, they might do a TDD kata or something and feel like, oh, this was great, this was really fun, uh, but then as like, you know, they hit reality next Monday and they get a real story like this when they realize, how do I apply TDD to what I'm actually doing at work? And this is something uh, that I'd like to address, uh, this is a little, but we're going to do a little mini design session uh, about this problem up front as if we we're at a whiteboard together. Now, I don't normally go to a whiteboard and write this kind of stuff out, but I think it's a good way to visualize what's going through my brain when I'm practicing TDD. So at the top, I have an entry point. This is the thing that somebody is going to call. It's my unusual spending module. And if I think about it, at this point, sure, I could write one huge function that implements it all straight away and I could figure it out and it would be fine if only like maybe a mess to deal with later. But at this point, I want to just be lazy. I want to say, like, what are the things that I could break this up into by saying, if only I had some code that did this, and if only I had some code that did this, and if only I had some code that did this, what would those jobs be? Well, the first job, obviously, is I wish I had some other module that could just fetch the payments for me given a user ID. That would be great. The next thing I think about is like, it would be great if I had another module that, given a bunch of payments, would determine the high spending. Maybe the structure of those payments looks something like, it has an amount, it has a category, and otherwise they're in a big array. And third, it'd be great if I had something that knew how to notify cardholders, given a whole bunch of totals for a given category, and maybe a comparison of this month versus last month's totals. 
it would figure out how to compose and send that email for me. And if I had modules that did those three things, this top level thing's job becomes really simple. If you think about single responsibility principle and object design, this thing has the, like, a clear responsibility, so does that thing, so does that thing. The top level single responsibility is no longer any of those three things, it's simply the delegation between those things. So when you think about what a very narrowly focused test of that thing would be, is it's a test that successfully coordinates the collaboration of those three things, and that's the type of test we're gonna look at today. So let's write a different type of test. Now, um, caveat here, uh, like Brian mentioned, I come from an agency called Test Double, uh, and I already explained that Test Doubles are the name of this particular jargon from testing, a uh, thing that stands in for another thing in a test. So I realize that some branding confusion may <laughs> result from the fact that we've also written our own test double library. Um, really what happened was one day in the shower I realized that we weren't yet squatting on the name test double on NPM. Uh, and I was like, well, we gotta do that. And then I had just been talking to somebody at NPM about how they're removing all the squatting uh, 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 packages. And I was like, well, now I gotta write a real test double library. And so several days later, <laughs> I emerged from my cave and I've written uh, testdouble.js. You can install it with npm install. And if you're a node, it's very easy. Usually we just make a global called td and require testdouble. Uh, if you're in a browser, you, we still recommend installing via npm, but then you can symlink out or copy out the browser distribution that's under dist. And this is all up in the readme. Now, Another thing is, I, today I didn't want to go through the rigmarole of teaching everyone like Mocha or Jasmine or QUnit or a testing framework around it. Uh, those are all great, and in any real project I'd probably use those too. Uh, but instead I just wanted like a really lightweight little test framework, so I spent last weekend, instead of working on this talk, building a test framework. Uh, it's called, <laughs> it's a recurring theme <laughs> in my alcohol addiction. Uh, it's called uh, Teeny Test. And it's really, really tiny. It's a very simple Node.js test runner. Really, at the end of the day, by default, you just put all your tests in anything under test lib. Uh, and any module that it finds in there that exports a single function, it assumes that's a test function. And any uh, module that exports an object of functions, it assumes that each of those functions on that object are test functions, unless they're like before each or after each kind of hooks. Uh, so that's actually a really nice little uh, test runner if you want zero API, zero configuration. Now I said I was gonna write a test, and this is all just one test. This is just the test for that top level thing, uh, and this is exactly how I would have written it. So brace yourself, because it's kind of a wall of text coming up. A Lot of text, holy crap, what the, what the hell, that's really scary, that's a lot going on, and so we're gonna walk through that on just like a line by line basis. Now the important stuff is load the subject. The, su the, the subject, literally the test subject, is just the thing I always name the thing that I'm testing, so here, it's um, requiring the module. Next up, uh, uh, let's see, got to get the user ID. It doesn't really matter what, I'm just calling it 42. Then down here, invoke the subject. So those three things don't involve test doubles at all. That's kind of similar to that first test that we had, uh, and that's as, as far as we had gotten. But because in the mini design session, which is probably happening in my brain normally, but at a whiteboard if I'm pairing with you maybe, is that we decided that we also had these three other responsibilities we wanted to break this down into. Fetch payments, something that determines high spending, and something that notifies cardholders. Those things clearly do not exist yet. And so if they don't exist yet, how do we make them exist for our tests? Starting with fetch payments, we call td.replace, and then give it the path to where we expect that module to be. So let's talk about the td.replace API. What it is, is it's effectively unobtrusive dependency injection for Node.js. It lets us give it any sort of path that's relative to the test file listing. And then what I do is some evil stuff where I monkey patch require, and any subsequent attempt in that runtime to load lib slash fetch payments.js, it's replaced with a test double. And that test double is intelligently inferred based on the type of thing the module exports. So if the module exports a function, it'll give you a test double function. If it exports an object, it'll give you a test double object of all of those functions. If it gives you a constructor, it'll give you an instantiation of all of those. Um, it's really pretty simple and it's very low friction from a usage perspective. Then of course, after your test runs, it'll restore, require, unmonkey patch everything and people will be able to go and load the real fetch payments module. So again, this is a, um, uh, often called outside-in test-driven development. These things below us don't exist yet, so we have to fake it. 
until we make it at each layer that we go. And each test responsibility is only of the code that is specifying uh, uh, lexically. Like literally, we're just specifying the code that goes in the unusual spending uh, 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 file listing. None of this stuff beneath it. So now that we know td.replace, we can also uh, 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 stub out the determine high spending and the notify cardholder. Those values getting returned are the test doubles that will get injected if somebody attempts to require those things. Next up, we got to configure um, uh, the test double, right? Because currently, uh, uh, remember that payment API doesn't exist, just like that fetch payments module doesn't exist yet. And so we have to prime it. Given that user ID, we have to return some kind of payments. So we do that here using td.win. This is called in testable parlance a stubbing. So when I call td.win, we're gonna kinda do a sentence diagram of this API. td.win configures a test double to respond in a certain way when it's invoked as you say it should be. So we call td.win, and then you can see it's a really goofy API because inside of the parentheses here, we rehearse the invocation of the dependency how we expect the subject to actually invoke it. So we're saying fetch payments, and then we pass it 42, because that's what we expect it to be invoked with. And then finally chaining off of that, we say then return whatever, some payments. It doesn't really matter that the data structure be correct here, because this is JavaScript, uh, and, and types don't matter. <laughs> so, so all that matters is it be the same thing that goes into the next thing, like we're passing a baton between our different units. So for instance, if we uh, were to call fetch payments after configuring this stubbing and passing it 42, we would get some payments back, the string. But if we pass it some other number, we're gonna get undefined because that stubbing has not been configured. And if we pass it nothing, also undefined. Um, uh, if we pass it additional arguments, we'll also get undefined. It's very strict by default, it expects it. It's a super isolated unit test. Of course you can figure it exactly how you expect it to be invoked. This is totally unlike, by the way, Jasmine Spies, or if you've ever used sign on JS. But if you want the looser stuff, you can uh, configure it. Yeah, you got a question? It's just, I'm a little surprised that you return undefined as opposed to fail the test immediately. Uh, talk to me after that. Because the historical reasons, I, I would know why you'd expect that. But we've got a lot of people here who I don't want to spoil their brains uh, uh, with that terribleness that you just suggested. So. <laughs> I have opinions. So, <laughs> so that's, that's uh, the first use of td.win. Uh, uh, using what we've already learned, we can now do the second stubbing as well. So we get the payments for that particular user. Given some payments, we know that we want to pass those into that second module, the one that determines where the high spending occurred. So we literally just tell it, if it receives exactly what it just got from the payment fetcher, then go ahead and return something that represents high spending. And finally, our verification, because every test isn't doing anything unless it asserts on something, is that notify cardholder gets invoked with the user ID as well as with that high spending. So td.verify is the last bit of API we'll talk about in this test. Now, sentence diagramming this again, td.verify simply ensures that the, the test double that it's about to be passed is called like we expect. And just like we rehearsed the, the, in the stubbing configuration, what happens inside of its invocation operator is we demonstrate the invocation as we expected it to occur. In this case with 42 and with uh, the string high spending. Now if it, if it doesn't get that, it'll blow up. But if, it, if that did actually occur, uh, it'll pass cleanly and it won't do anything. Um, notice too that throughout the API, win and verify, their APIs are completely symmetrical. They take all of the same options, they take all the same advanced configuration. Um, and, and there's lots of them, like matchers and captures and series and stuff. Uh, as a rule of thumb, too, if you're new to using test doubles, it's, it's tempting to try to verify absolutely everything that happens, but most often it's not that necessary. I, only if the method that you're testing is void, doesn't return anything useful, uh, if, you're, if, if the t method that you're writing is just for the side effect, at that point the last thing that it does, maybe verify is necessary. But usually it's probably only 20% of the time is it necessary for me because code that returns values is generally easier to maintain than code that has side effects. So given that this is our graph of stuff, what I've found over the course of the last couple years of practicing TDD this way is that I keep falling into the same kind of shape. I'm, I'm clearly building a tree of functions and everything along the left side of this pyramid are extract, loading, 
go fetch me the data. Everything in the middle is transform. It's like pure functions. These are really nice little unit tests that don't need test doubles that just you know, take in some input, give you some output, and everything on the last leg of the pyramid is load, like have some side effect, call some other system, return some, some network request to the user. Uh, I keep seeing this pattern emerge, and I've been able to exploit that on several of the projects since then in how I organize my code. If you think a little bit less uh, from like an ETL perspective, what you're really saying is that anything on the left side of these graphs is a query, anything in the middle is sort of like where your business logic lives, and then everything on the right triggers some kind of side effect. Given that too, just to skip ahead a little bit, is when, it would be unfair for me to like paint this tree and only get down to the second layer because I want, if this is recursion where I'm gonna show you how to write this first test and the second test, there needs to be some kind of base case so that you can see how the tree of functions finishes. Well, if you think about the fetch payments object, it's gonna have a couple of responsibilities. If you read through the readme, it's clear that like you need to know uh, uh, what months you're looking up, so something that can get you this month and last month uh, as a very pure function would be, would be one thing to have. Another thing that wraps the payment API for you so that you don't have to make raw network requests. Uh, something that determines the high spending, these are probably pure functions. Categorize the payments, group them by category. You'd probably want something to compare the totals to make sure if it's over a certain threshold, keep it. And then something that filters just the high spending. And then to notify the cardholder, I could imagine maybe I'd want something uh, that composes an email and maybe something else that sends an email. At this point, especially if you're used to writing a lot of JavaScript that's like very full of nested functions, you might think like how overkill it is to imagine this many small units or files shaking out from a design of a function that's so simple. But at the end of the day, like, uh, especially when I'm practicing the style of test driven development, I really lean hard into trying to shake out as many uh, distinct uh, custom objects and functions as possible because what I'm guaranteed to have with each of them is a very well-named, well-conceived thing. It's not so much about whether I'm gonna be able to reuse it, it's whether or not somebody's able to, to glance at it and understand immediately what it does. And also I know that in real life, if I, if I aim to have 50 custom objects for every story, I'm gonna be pressured to like move a little bit faster than that in real life and maybe I'll settle for 25. But if I immediately assume I'm gonna do everything in bit, one big gigantic function, I know that in real life that gigantic function is gonna be twice as long as it otherwise would be. All right, so we, shot, we walked through that first test. Now let's try to run it. So we run npm test and teeny test tells us it cannot fetch module lib fetch payments. Unfortunately, it just blew up on the very first line that we wrote. Uh, so that's not good. But it's okay because uh, even though you might have been taught in the past that test-driven development is uh, red, green, and refactor, uh, my style is not that way. Uh, in fact, the way that I do it, it's typically red, and then a different red, and then a different red, and so on, <laughs> until eventually green, and then we just move on to the next red. <clears throat> so you learn to stop thinking that red is a bad thing. In fact, Jay Fields, way back in uh, about 10 years ago in Rubyland, he said that, in test-driven development, your goal is not necessarily to always take an action that makes the test pass. Your goal is either make the test pass or change the message. Because if you can change what the computer is telling you, then you've probably made some kind of progress. So I want to clear that particular message. So I'm going to create libfetch payments, which I'm just going to stub out, right? I don't have a test for that yet. It doesn't have to do anything. All I know is it has to export a function, so it gets replaced with a function by test double js. I'm using the test to force myself to shake out a lot of the plumbing in my application for me. So now the message changed, right? Lib determine high spending doesn't exist. So I'm gonna go ahead, module exports function, lib determine high spending, and now it's saying lib notify cardholder doesn't exist. And when I talked about test driven development giving you the benefit of like feeling a sense of progress, it feels to me like paint by numbers, right? So we're just doing like one little tiny step at a time and other than like knowing the, the API for the test double framework or knowing how to break the problem down, you're mostly letting the computer tell you how to do your job, which is really great for me who likes to just check out <laughs> most of the day. Um, uh, frankly, I'm so, I'm so context switched to death that having something that aids in my ability to focus on what the next thing to do is is really beneficial. So I create lib notify cardholder, export that function, and now sort of ironically, it says lib unusual spending, which is actually the thing under test. That doesn't exist either, so that shouldn't need to exist. 
uh, which is a little bit embarrassing. But then we go and create the thing. Uh, we, we implement it with just a stub function as well. And now we get to the meat of like any good test double framework or any good assertion uh, framework is only as good as the messages that it outputs. So test double JS finally is to the point now where we got to our logical error where we were saying, we expect notify cardholder to get invoked. And here it's saying unsatisfied verification. We wanted it to be called with 42 and high spending. But there were no invocations to that test double, which makes sense, right? Because the implementation so far is an empty function. And so now we have everything that we need to write this idyllic little tiny function that does nothing other than interact with these three things. We can go and uh, require fetch payments, determine high spending, notify cardholder. Remember, from the test perspective, those are all going to be replaced with test doubles. But that's exactly as I would write it in production anyway. And so this will work fine in production. Now I export a function that takes in a user ID. Um, I go and fetch the payments, return that as payments. I go and determine high spending, passing in the payments. And then I can finally call notify cardholder with the user ID as well as whatever that high spending was. And now, this is way at the bottom here, but it's green. So the test passes, and I'm happy. So congratulations, we wrote a test. Uh, feels pretty good. Of course, we only wrote one test, and it took us like 15 minutes to walk through it. Uh, which, might, which might make you feel like this is not possibly worth the time. Uh, uh, trust me, it gets a little bit better. Uh, uh, it only took me a few minutes to write it because I'm really familiar with this particular process. Um, but <clears throat> thinking back on the benefits of TDD as I've explained how I feel about it, first talking about focus, if I'm handed this story card, even if I have this good of an understanding of what it's going to take to go into f implementing this entire story, I'm worried about everything. Like, right out the gate, I'm, my brain's bouncing around, how am I going to do all this stuff? Um, what's great about this approach is that once that test passes at the top, this unusual spending test of the very, very top level thing, it's counterintuitive because we're not used to thinking of this way. But once that test is passing, I'm probably never going to go back and look at that module again. Now, instead of one gigantic problem, I have three medium-sized problems that I can focus on, which is really helpful. Additionally, when we start talking about the recursion step, the base case of this recursion, fetch payments, um, if we were to have some unit at the bottom that's a pure function, like maybe it has methods like this month and last month, so we can pass those into the payment API. They're pure functions, which means their tests are really simple and straightforward. We call them, we get a month back, we make sure it's the right month. And that means that that test doesn't need any test doubles at all because it's not a test of the collaboration of multiple things. It's just a test of a pure function. And uh, test doubles, as, as much as they're really fun to use and stuff, uh, 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 they don't test that things are actually working in the same way that a test of a pure function makes sure that things are actually working. So this is a superior test. That means you want to maximize the number of things in your functional trees that are just simple, pure functions, because they're the easiest things to compose and work with. And it represents a base case in our recursion. When this thing is implemented as a pure function, we're done. And then we can move on to the next thing in the tree, which maybe is this wrapper for the payment API. The other type of thing that we see a lot are wrappers. So we have some third-party API, maybe it's an HTTP API, and all we're doing is just delegating. Like, hey, here's my little Node.js function that's shaped idiomatically, like all my other ones. If I were to write a unit test of it, it wouldn't really help the design because I'm not very much in control of the design of the thing that it's wrapping. So if I felt like pain during my unit test of that, it would be useless pain because that pain wouldn't encourage me to actually improve the design of that third-party API. As a result, I tend not to unit test those wrappers. I might have an integration test to make sure that the API adheres to the contract that we've agreed to, but there's no benefit there to having a unit test, which means it's also a base case in our recursion. So now, if I've implemented this one's uh, collaboration test and this test and this test, I know this is completely done, uh, and I can move on to determine high spending or however it is I choose to break the work up. The next thing that I like is a sense of progress. So you notice like the error messages that we got, granted they were all red, but they were very clear and very, very small steps. At no step did I ask myself, holy shit, what do I do next? At every single step I knew exactly what to do next because I concocted a test that was going to give me very clear, very actionable messages until I finally got to green. And even then I know what to do next because I have in my mind this hierarchy of functions that need to be implemented. It's not this, which is what I ran into a lot when I was practicing more classical TDD. It's like, OK, well, now how do I assert an email got sent, or even send one? Or how will I create a fake payment API until the real one exists? And, and, 
And all of that noise clouds the fact that my real job here is categorizing those payments and summing up the totals. But I view that as the easy job because it's lower risk and my priorities get all the muck. I much prefer the top case because it helps me break the problem down. Curing blank page syndrome, uh, uh, additionally, just to hammer home the point, I tend to ask a lot of how questions. Like if I'm in an iteration planning meeting and I'm hearing all this stuff, I'm just panicking and they're asking for an estimate. I'm like, well, you're not going to get an estimate until you tell me how this is going to happen, how that's going to happen, how that's going to happen, how all of this is going to happen. I overwhelm myself and I start breathing into a paper bag. But this approach helps me focus just on this one layer at a time. I'm writing a test of just the code that's going to go into this one module, and if only it could talk to this thing and this thing and this thing and wire those three things together, then I'd be done. So how do I do that? And then the framing in my mind becomes more about what should be ideally underneath me at each of those layers. What? I wish I had a thing that could fetch payments. What would be the ideal API from the perspective of this top thing? More focused on what am I building and less on the minutia of how. And as a result, really gross uh, implementation de details I've noticed have tend not to leak upward uh, uh, through my abstractions anymore. My abstractions are much, much more tightly focused. Finally, I love that this slows us down because most of the JavaScript that I read looks a lot like this. This is the same feature implemented in Spaghetti JavaScript that I wrote all at once. So I'm pulling in request, moment, email, lodash, I write a function that just slams together a URL uh, of the current month, gets some payments back, subtracts a month from it, slams together another URL, totals all of it up using Lodash uh, and group by, gets the value, totals up last month by copying and pasting the last three lines and getting the value, figures out the high spending by filtering out the difference of the two, less 150%. So I have all the info I need, now I can just spend, send a huge email, which I you know, start writing, I just saw a misspelling, uh, map over all the stuff, join it together by using sum, which you should totally not use for joining strings, but I did it because it worked. And then, and then I'm done. And this looks like every Express.js app I've ever read ever, like times however many routes are in your application. Uh, so I wrote that in under 10 minutes, which means my boss loves me, right? Because uh, I was able to move really, really fast and furious for now. But of course, as soon as it comes time to change that thing, I'm going to have to go and trudge up what the hell was I thinking when I wrote that the first time. And so the benefit of TDD to slow the team down is actually huge. Uh, and one of the reasons why I think us as a community need to be a little bit more honest about TDD when we're selling it to our management. What I think a lot of people, like managers, thought was like, oh, TDD is great because I'm going to have a test for everything. They didn't necessarily think that it was going to come at the cost of slowing you down. And sure, you can make some kind of theoretical case, like it'll speed us up in the long run because we won't have this technical debt. But I think that's sort of like an unfair sleight of hand. I think, you know, faster is not always equal to better. So that's the framing I want to give for why I feel like TDD is a soft skill. Um, uh, that's the perspective that I come at with it, and that informs all of the libraries and APIs that I write and all the training and teaching that I do and practice I do around test levels. Uh, I think I'll have time for questions, but first I want to give a kind of general uh, overview of the API, what's actually in the API, uh, because that was just one example of one test. Uh, you can also play along. If you go to our website, testdouble.com, you can play with it in the console. Just type fetch and then pass it the string test double. It'll actually go out to GitHub and download the library and let you play with it uh, in a console. So for creating test doubles, we have a couple APIs. The first is td.function. So we saw td.replace today because in Node.js we're able to go and require it for you and go and create it. If you say td.function and then pass it the name of a function, that'll give you a test double function that you can use in any context, especially in the browser. You can also say td.object, and you can pass this one a few interesting things. Like you can pass it an array of names and it'll give you those named functions back. So faces.smile, faces.frown would be a function smile, a function frown. You could also pass it an object literal it will clone that object, even the non-function things on it, find all the functions, and then return you test doubles of all of those. So face.smile and frown are still test doubles. You could also pass it a constructor function. So here, if uh, smile and frown are prototypal functions, we could pass that to td.object, and what it'll give us back is the same thing, finding all of the prototypal functions with good naming. Um, 
Uh, so additionally, uh, uh, like we just saw with td.replace, if foodjs is just a function, we call it td.replace, give it the path, we'll get a function back. If it's a object literal of functions, we can call td.replace and get an object back of all of those functions. We can also do the same thing on a prototypal constructor and, and call new against it. Another thing that a lot of testable frameworks and libraries fail is that they don't, they're not helpful either in their error messages or helping uh, you debug what the hell is going on at any given point. So I wrote a function called td.explain. And you can pass it any testable function at any point in any test, and it will give you a lay of the land of like what's going on with this test double. How many times has it been called? A log of every call and invocation against it. A log of every stubbing that's been made against it, as well as a textual description of the current situation for that test double. Really, really handy, especially while you're learning, to just call td.explain a lot. Uh, uh, td.when, the stubbing facility. So we already saw an example, right? So if you call drive and pass it 60, I want to return some fire. So drive 60 gives you fire, drive 55 gets you undefined. Powerball, uh, so in this case, I wanted to return uh, a sequence of things. The first time I call it, I want to get five, then 18, and then four. So I call Powerball, I get five. I call it again, I get 18. I call it again, I get four. If I call it again, I get four again. It'll just keep stick on the last one in the series. Another uh, 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 function or option that's popular with td.win is times. Limit the number of times it'll respond a certain way. So when I call pop, up to two times, it'll should return nine. So I call pop, it returns nine. I call pop, it returns nine. I call it again, then I just get undefined as if it expires. And you can actually slam together multiple stubbings of the same function to like get everything in the order that you want for really you know, obtuse cases that are probably bad ideas. <laughs> Another thing that I wanted to be able to do is one-line stuff. Uh, sign on, a lot of libraries make it hard to one-liner a thing. Like if I, all I have is like a throwaway stubbing. Uh, I just want a test double that when I call it with 60 gives me fire, I should be able to do that in one line. So you can do that in one line. You just pass in the function, it'll return the test double. That way that works, that's great. Uh, another thing that's cool are matchers. Um, they live on td.matchers, and so td.matchers.anything, as you might predict, whether you know what a matcher is or not, will uh, be satisfied all of the time. So I grab anything, and I say td.win drive, and then when drive is passed anything, then return an ambulance. So if drive is called with 60, it gets an ambulance, or left, it gets an ambulance. But if it's called with left and then right, it gets undefined. Uh, or if it's called with no args, it gets undefined, because that doesn't satisfy the argument count. Uh, so I could do it with two args. Say the first arg has to be 60, and the second arg can be anything. And that works as you'd expect. Uh, you can also use this ignore extra args configuration. So anytime I call drive, no matter the number of arguments, always return an ambulance, uh, uh, which can be handy in some cases when we don't care about the uh, additional arguments. Uh, isa is a, is a type-based matcher. So here I can say if drive is called with a number, then return an ambulance. So here it's uh, pass 60 gets an ambulance, but passing it left gets undefined. Contains is a really fun one. Contains can handle strings, arrays, and objects. So in the string case, if I say drive contains room, then return a speedboat. So if I pass room, it gets a speedboat. If I pass something else unrelated, it gets undefined. But if I pass an array that contains the string room, it also gets a speedboat, because technically that's containing in it. Contains also works with objects, including sparse objects, which is really neat. So if I say any object that contains the key speed at 60, return a traffic light. So of course that's undefined, but, but an exact match works, but so does an exact match with like a whole bunch of other stuff thrown on it. It works with nested objects as well. This is a sparse object I was saying, so like any object for which, so if you've ever written a test double like a assertion or stubbing against some API that's gonna pass you like dozens of key value pairs you don't care about, encoding your, all that crap in your test just like couples you unnecessarily to that API. So here's a way, just in a targeted way, to say, if it contains exactly this property chain, then return this, and all that other junk just goes by the wayside. Uh, you can also pass in anonymous functions, any arg that does a certain thing. So when drive gets an arg that the speed is less than 55, return a truck. So 54 gets the truck, but 60 gets nothing, uh, is a handy matcher to have. You can also write custom matchers. There's nothing fancy about them. Literally, any function that returns an object with a, uh, uh, that returns an object property with a property underscore underscore matches that behaves like a matcher is now a matcher and can be used as a matcher. So this one is called is same and will only pass when it's exactly 
uh, three equal to whatever is passed in. So in this case, if I have two objects, wall and other wall, win drive is same wall, then return that thing. That means that this one passes, but the other one doesn't pass, where normally it would do a deep equals comparison and return true. Verify uh, uh, is very simple. So uh, uh, if we have a function called exhaust and we pass it some cloud of smoke, back in our test we can verify it was called cloud of smoke and then nothing happens. It just, it's a no op when it's satisfied. But if exhaust is called with a big explosion, then back in our test and we call it, we expected it to be called with a smoke, then the verification error is thrown with a nice long message explaining what it expected to be called with. And what's nice is verify and win were implemented side by side. They have identical APIs. You can use any matcher for either uh, uh, to, 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 to either stub or verify only exactly what you care about. Um, so so uh, uh, looking at the contains matcher, you know, we can say TD verify. Uh, the exhaust contains something with the letter I, that'll pass just fine. Finally, last thing, uh, if you're going to integrate this into your test suite, just throw td.reset into an after each somewhere so it can clean up after itself. Uh, so that way it can reset at any given point in your test suite uh, all of the existing test doubles if any happen to leak between your tests. So if I create a test double with a particular stubbing and I hit reset, then I call it again, it'll return an undefined. It just Blank slateifies all of my test doubles. Uh, the two uh, uh, libraries we looked at today, well, we didn't really look at teeny test, but we were seeing it anyway because it's got no API. Teeny test is down there, and test double lives at test double slash test double dot js. Uh, so that's everything that I got to present to you guys tonight. I hope that this was interesting, uh, potentially useful. Uh, uh, normally I don't take questions, but I'm in a super good mood. So if anyone has any questions or comments other than the thing about the mocks blowing up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, we don't we don't support uh, uh, ordered invocation. So you can't say for instance that like this test double was called and then this one. There is a hinky way to do that, but I found that every time I've needed that feature, this is the great thing by being a library author, by the way, is whenever you say you wish you had a feature, I'm like, well, anytime you need that, that's clearly you're doing it wrong. <laughs> so that's what I'm saying. Yeah, I'm Matt LaForest. Okay, I, I can barely hear you. My, my td.win examples when I'm rehearsing the invocation, what about it? With linting? I don't know. Probably great. <laughs> I'm, su I'm sure that there's a way to turn that one off. I don't know. Uh, yeah, so, so Matt gets at an interesting point, which is that this API is probably unlike any that you've ever seen before, right? Where you're literally invoking a thing inside of an invocation operator entirely, and that's so that you can practice it exactly like you expect it to be seen, so that lexically it looks like you could copy and paste it if you wanted to. Um, now, under the hood, the API does nothing. All that it's really doing is looking for the last testable call, and that's what's wiring it all up. That's why a linter might go off. Yeah, that's a good point. Anyone else? Yeah. How do I deal with promises? Um, we've got a couple of matchers that have some like conveniences for promises. Uh, if you check out the GitHub issues, uh, uh, but frankly, like this has been fine. Like if you just like pass in an auto result and like an already resolved promise, everything tends just to flow through it. Um, we haven't needed to build in any additional promise -y stuff. Same thing kind of goes for callbacks. There's like a, a way to trigger a, um, instead of returning a value, have some kind of action where we maybe trigger a callback manually, that kind of thing. Um, uh, grab me after though if you want to talk more about that. So did I convert anyone? Is anyone interested in like taking a serious look at this? A couple of people are nodding heads. Who here uses sign on JS currently? Okay, why do you sign on JS? <laughs> I don't mean to sound that super negatively. The guy who maintains that is actually a really nice guy. He's really great. Uh, but I struggled with it a lot for how I use uh, test doubles and how I practice TDD. Uh, I just hit a brick wall, uh, especially around their chaining API. I have a feeling like it was designed for a use that was not how I was using test doubles. Uh, does anyone here, after seeing this, still think that they are going to prefer sign on? Because I'd be genuinely curious to understand what, what it offers that, I, that this doesn't. I, I think it's just that if I use sign on, it doesn't have anything about it, but it's like the same thing. 
Okay, cool. One thing Sinon has going for it is like a gajillion users. And this one has concierge level support. <laughs> for, for now. Anyone else use Sinon that thinks that it has something that this doesn't have as far as you can tell that you would want? Then do and then throw are also implemented, yeah. Yeah, good question. One thing I saw is that the list of APIs already built, already existed out there. So now you have to go through the implementation of the sign in. So I've done this a million times. <laughs> yeah, I see a lot of crufty kind of copy pasted code or people with, with these test helpers that kind of abstract themselves away from sign on. Um, You like this matcher syntax? Yeah, I'm sure that they are. Yeah. Uh, uh, one reason I like writing testable libraries is that they're not really hard to write. Uh, <laughs> so they're pretty similar. One feature I didn't get to mention if anyone uses Firefox or if they're interested in the ES uh, 2017 proxy object, uh, which is only supported in Firefox right now, testable actually already supports proxy objects. So, so if you just give it a string and say td.object and then a name of a thing, it'll assume it's a proxy object and it'll respond to literally every method invocation against it uh, by dynamically creating testables as you work with the object. It's a really fun way to work uh, if you only have to support Firefox, which is none of us. So <laughs> that's why I didn't make that a slide. Okay, one last one. Yeah, it works the same way. So like, whether it's a class or whether it's a constructor function, if that gets exported, what gets replaced is a, um, what you get back as the test is a bag of all of the testable functions, just like you normally would. What it gets stubbed out, because it would be an impedes mismatch to just give it that into the, into the subject, what it gets fed is actually an artificial constructor called fake whatever it is. They call new against that artificial constructor, and then they get the same bag of test doubles so that you can control it. It works. All right, well, thanks for your time. Thanks for being super patient. I'm going to hopefully stroll over to Arena and get a chance to chat with some of y'all at happy hour. Brian, you got some more stuff for us? Cool.